The following presentation was recorded live for the International Association of Square Dance Callers 33rd Annual Convention. We take you live to the Renaissance Suites Hotel in Charlotte, North Carolina, where our session is just getting underway. After, so this is probably a, a good time to start. If there's anybody out in the hall who's lurking that wants to come in, you could uh, shout at them. Uh, my name is uh, Barry Clasper uh, from Toronto, Canada, and this is my wife, Pam. And um, we've been asked to moderate this session, but um, I'd like to say up front that uh, we're hoping this is going to be more of a discussion than some sort of a panel presentation. It's definitely not going to be a panel presentation. Um, they've asked to asked us to record this, so uh, we, we should be using the mic whenever we uh, uh, speak, which doesn't lend itself to discussion very well, but uh, I'm prepared if the discussion is valuable to just turn the recording off. The discussion is more important than, than having the recording. Um, let me explain what this is going to be. As I said, if you're in the room because you're hoping that we have some kind of uh, well-researched, uh, effective answer to the problem that I'm going to describe, um, you're in the wrong place. <laughs> this is definitely um, a situation where we realized we have a problem that we had to cope with in our area. And as we discussed it with various people last year, uh, we realized that it seemed that other people at least had inklings of the problem and that maybe this is more widespread than, than we thought, and it's something that we should uh, figure out if there's a way that we can deal with it um, more effectively rather than just everybody kind of, you know, steal, grit their teeth and, and, and plow through it. So let me explain the situation in our environment um, as kind of a framework for the rest of the discussion. And what we'd be interested in hearing is if other people have shared similar experiences, if they have uh, done things to try and cope with that, and if they did, how well did it work? Um, what do people think about this as a, as a general problem that perhaps Caller Lab should pay more attention to, meaning, you know, should we have repeats of meetings like this? Should it turn into a committee? Um, or should there be some research done in the area or whatever? This is very much a feel the problem out, kind of see what kind of beastie we've got here uh, kind of meeting. Now, the, the situation that generated this in our minds was uh, we have a, a small C3A dancing group, and um, one of the ladies in the group was diagnosed with al Alzheimer's. And uh, her husband came to us in confidence and, you know, said she's been diagnosed and uh, we'd like to keep dancing as long as we can uh, because, you know, the, the social thing with friends is very important. Uh, plus, the activity itself is something that uh, strengthens her, you know, prolongs her uh, uh, period of being functional. You know, the more she can uh, use the facility she's got left, then the, uh, you know, the longer that she, she can remain, um, I was going to say a useful member of society, but that's not what I meant. You know, the, the, longer, she, the longer she can enjoy life is, is what it boils down to. Um, what's happened is over the past couple of years, um, you know, in the beginning, nobody knew and you couldn't tell. Um, and over the past couple of years, that situation has changed. Now it's obvious when you talk to her that there's, you know, something going on there. Uh, she's reached a stage now where she's having problems with language. So, you know, she substitutes one word for another or she can't find words. And there are nights when literally nobody knows what she's trying to say. Now, despite that, she still has some level of functionality as a dancer. And we're talking about C3. Now, it's not a strong C3A group, but still, you know, we're not talking about uh, the easiest choreography around. Um, and it's kind of interesting, actually, the things that she can do versus the things that she has trouble with. You know, she can do some very complicated calls, and she just does them. So they've obviously been drilled into some structure in her mind that, uh, you know, really hung on to it. And yet other things which are, you know, very simple are starting to go. Uh, I've actually watched her lose the square. And we're talking about one square in a basement. And she loses track of not just what the formation is, but where the people are. I've seen her kind of looking around like, where did everybody go? Um, and she starts spinning. Um, and, you know, it depends on some nights are better than others. And we have no idea how much longer she's going to be able to come. Um, and one of the things we're wrestling with is, is there going to come a point 
when we should say to them, you really shouldn't come anymore because the burden you're placing on the other dancers in the group who have all, you know, they have been really generous about this. The other dancers, uh, now they all know, they under, understand what the situation is. Uh, they've been more than willing to help as best they can. They all still come out um, and they, they help her through when she needs help. Uh, but at some point, uh, dancing involves kind of a contract between the, the the players. You know, we all come with a, an obligation to, you know, do our best to try and make the best uh, dance experience for everyone. And, you know, while we can have these, uh, you know, social trade-offs, we all have things that we give and things that we receive, at what point is it unfair to the other dancers to continue in this way? And obviously the other dancers have a big say in what that point is. But as leaders, I think we need to we need to try and understand how we can discern when that tipping point is without having people make up excuses to leave the group or someone finally get angry and you know it becomes a, a big emotional thing. That's kind of what I'm wrestling with in my own mind at the moment because we can see this time coming. And um, when do you take action, and uh, or or do you wait for them to decide it's too much and you know. I'm kind of hoping that they'll decide before I have to worry about anything. But that's the situation that's that's generated this. Now, there's all kinds of, of disabilities that can affect people's ability to dance. So in our case, it's a lady with Alzheimer's, but it could be, you know, people that have uh, um, med new medicines and stuff that they go on. We have another fellow who we think is on and off medication because we can tell differences in the way he dances. Um, but some people, you know, will have an illness that uh, temporarily cause, makes it difficult for them to dance. All oh, right. And uh, another friend of ours uh, mentioned that he has a fellow in his group who is going blind slowly. So, and again, at some point, he's going to have difficulty dancing. And we have people with, uh, you know, joint problems and back problems and things like that, which can make their dancing more difficult. So that's the nature of the problem that we'd like to discuss. As I say, we we don't have answers. We're uh, looking to provoke some discussion, maybe get some ideas. Um, if it seems to be something that uh, you know people would like to look at in more detail, um, we could perhaps towards the end of the meeting talk about what we, where we go from now as a, as an organization, as Caller Lab. Is this something that perhaps uh, we just send some emails around this group and we communicate with one another as kind of a support group, or you know it could be something that uh, turns into something more formal within Caller Lab. We don't know. Pam, did you have anything that you wanted to add to that? So, yes, come and get the mic. Uh, Mike Callahan from the Rochester, New York area. Do you feel this is more prevalent or noticeable at the higher levels of dancing? Is that, does anybody think that in the, area, in the room here? Okay. I think... Um, those of us who've been calling a long time and have a group like you do, I mean, they're not just dancers, they're friends. And this is our problem of, you know, do we tell them to leave, when, and so forth. I have a gentleman, I have a, an advanced group who he had a knee replacement. And uh, you can see him. Now, I don't know if he's on, like you say, medication or anything like that, but he's kind of starting to lose it. And it's almost like he doesn't really want to be there, but his wife is like, you're here, you know, and she almost like forces him to come, and I don't think he really wants to, to come that much anymore. Now, in your situation, I would think the husband would sort of take the initiative of that, and um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, well, I, I, I'm starting to run, because I've been calling a long time, and I'm starting to run in those type of situations every once in a while also, and that's why I was interested in the group. So we have uh, the same situation in a group. Um, Eric Hennerlaw, Court of Madeira, California, um, an advanced group that I took over a year ago. Uh, the chairman of that group, w they were an elderly couple, and when I took it over, I was kind of given the uh, underlying subtext that I should maybe change management of the group. And so we did that, um, and we made the past chairman's kind of an honorary member. They don't pay anything. And over time, They've, they've come less and less. But what I found out very shortly as we went out to the pizza parlor one night afterwards, he told me he had Alzheimer's. And so it kind of explained a lot of what was going on with them and, and their age and, and his particular condition. Um, the end result of that is that they, they do come 
most weeks and dance a few tips. And when they do dance, we just make sure, and this is the A2 level, we make sure that I make it short and simple enough that they can get through it. So I accommodate them. Although at some point, it will come to that tipping point where I probably will have to have a discussion. The difficulty is it's a slippery slope because like a beginner class where you have people that don't, or any other class where you have people that don't have the capabilities to do what you're trying to do in your program, and you start you know, somehow removing them from that program, and then you go to the next person, the next person. Next thing you know, you have one person left. And, you, and it's a very delicate situation because you can't sit there and pick the cream of the crop all the time, or there's no crop anymore. So I, I don't have any good answer, but I recognize the same problem. Uh, John Marshall, Sterling, Virginia. We're seeing a, a variety of, of these types of things. We're seeing, you know, what we call the walking wounded, you know, the hip replacements, the knee replacements. We've had uh, one dancer for a period of time who went through both the heart attack followed by the stroke. Um, but, you know, the first go around of that, you know, the coming back, and, and he would tell us, you know, if it wasn't for dancing, I would never have had a recovery because he, he came back uh, further. And then he started to lose it again and ultimately did lose it. But uh, we've been with us a long, long time. And everybody became very tolerant of, you know, being careful of him, handing him off one to another. It wasn't because he didn't know. He physically couldn't move. You know, in terms of, of mental capacity, he was okay. Just made the uh, but he get real dizzy, and, and he couldn't move well. So we had that, and it, the deal with me was, I'm sorry, there's no way I'm asking him to leave. You know, he's been with us for 25 years. Yeah. And, it, you know... And nobody asked, actually, to, in, to, to everybody's credit, nobody came and asked me to ask him to leave. Uh, so that that one took care of itself. But they don't always. You know, we do get some, you know, if, you know if we just can't stand to be in a square because, you know, we don't get anything. And yet people can see that potential in themselves, happening in themselves. And so that holds them at bay a bit, I think, before anybody gets too pushy about it. And you try to keep it light. We had one other couple that was very interesting. They were happened to be A2 dancers. They were average A2 dancers. Older couple came to me privately and said, you know, I was doing C1 lessons. And they came to me and they said, we don't have any expectation of becoming C1 dancers, but we are very fearful of starting to approach Alzheimer's issues and, and, and historically in the family and for ourselves. and getting up there and we think that the mental stimulation of learning and being in the learning environment may well help us to push that off, you know, keep that at bay to some degree. Um, everything you can find and read about tells us to you know, stimulate your mind as much as you can, read, so on. And what am I going to say to these folks? Uh, gee, no, yeah, I understand, but sorry, you know. Of course I didn't say that. You know, we, we welcome them in. Uh, I take particular care of them. And they did actually remarkably well. Um, but then well into the, uh, actually probably right after the, the year-long class. This was the class that would not die, you know. They, they would have, they'd still be in class three years from now, all of them, if I'd have let them know. But now he is starting to show definite signs. But I think we have a responsibility to... To them as people, you know, not as dancers. And if we start thinking about them that way instead of the dancers, then okay, we have to we have to suck that up to some degree, and maybe our programs suffer from a competency level at some point or another, and we deal with that until the problem resolves itself. Um, only one, and I'll stop talking just a second. Only one other time I can think of that there was a couple that danced to me. They were not married, but they had been partners forever. And uh, he suffered a stroke and not terribly long thereafter passed. And But she continued to come, and we had a partner for her, and she danced. Lovely lady. And she started to feel like she was beginning to lose her, her grip in terms of being competent and came to me one night at the end of the dance and said, uh, I wanted you to know that I've decided you know, I won't be dancing any longer. And I was like, well, why would you say that? I mean, I knew she was having some trouble, but she said, because uh, I, I really can't react and respond anymore. It's, it's not working for me. And uh, it's not only the other people that I'm concerned about, which I am, but I'm not able to enjoy it in the same way. So it's time. 
for me to, to move on to some other activity. And it was all the class in the world, you know. And of course, back then, this is a long time ago, and I was probably not as compassionate back then as I've learned to become after life beat me up a little bit more. But I was so relieved because it took all the burden off of me because she was that classy in terms of how she did it. It was great. But more often than not, that's not going to be the case. One comment and two questions. <laughs> Mike Jacobs, I haven't gotten to that part yet. <laughs> From Hamilton, New Jersey. Um, the first comment is is that, that in talking with an ER doctor, it, it you know one thing she pointed out is that that when you're under anesthesia, the short-term memory goes to pot, and so people that experience some difficulty in, in it may not necessarily be re relaying itself in their ability to function on the floor, but their mental process. It's because it's been short-circuited by the anesthesia. If they go under for any length of time, it really does affect things. And they get to punishing themselves because they're not responding. They think something's gone to pot, and it's really going to be something as long as a year for them to recover from that anesthesia, just depending on the length of time. The two questions, the two questions I have is, um, first of all, Jim Mayle has a, an article that, that he has around here that discussing the medical savant, the, uh, excuse me, the musical savant, you know, it, it, the, the people that, that, that don't respond well to other actions but respond well with music. And it seems to be that there is an underlying base emotion that relates itself to music and actions related to it. So my question to you is, is did you, when she does better with certain calls, is the music up in volume more at that time, and that the one she doesn't respond to as well is maybe when your music is down? And do you see any pattern in that regard? And, and the second question is, is for everyone is that I also saw uh, a, an individual on the floor who was an excellent dancer that suddenly had a really bad night. Two weeks later, she suffered an aneurysm that burst and it, it you know, went through the vegetable stage and so forth until she finally passed away. And, you know, I feel funny that I've seen it before in another situation, and I'm wondering if when I see that kind of, of action of a normally very competent answer suddenly going down the tubes and not because they had a bad day earlier on, is should I say something? I think we often have, uh, many of us have felt that uh, square dancing Oh, me, Pam Clasper, Toronto. Um, many of us have felt square dancing is somewhat like the canary in the coal mine, um, as Mike says, for you know the first indication of some of these um, instances. Um, something we'd really like to hear is there is any solutions anybody has. Um, ours to this problem has been, because it is a very, very small group, we have basically given up another night, and Barry calls another night for the rest of the dancers at a, quote, real level. Um, and so they get to dance. <laughs> oh, shut up, John. <laughs> they get to dance at a, at a higher level, at, at more of what they're capable of, and they are still, every single one of them is willing to come out and support this lady because they're getting another night. This couple has danced with us for 20 years. So, um, and as to the music, I haven't noticed anything because I dance with the group. I, I always dance with them every week, and I haven't noticed anything about the music. That's a very interesting question. What we notice is the moves that she can do are ones that she has done for 20 years. You put her out in left field somewhere and say quarter left, and she hasn't got a clue. Ask her to explode the top from anywhere, she's home free. It's, it's the stuff that's burned in. I guess, I don't know if it's an answer to Mike's second question, but I would believe that it depends in part, you were asking about, do you say something? You know, I think it depends in part on the relationship that you have with, with the couple and or, I mean, I've been known to, with one or two dancers, long time dancers, know them a long time, know them well, to take the spouse aside and say, is everything all right? You know, I'm I'm noticing a difference. You know, a big difference. Is just everything okay medically or at home or anything? I said, just kind of watch for those things. And I've known you for so long, and I know how you act and move. And uh, you know, or Frankie does. And I'm so I'm not. You know, I'm not sure. Is that is that everything okay? And if they tell me yes, or maybe they tell me something like, well, we're getting his medication balanced or whatever. I feel a little better. But if they say, gee, you know. I, I didn't know. I said, well, let's kind of keep an eye on things. At least that way they become a little more aware because if they're living with it every day, they may not notice it as readily if it's come on slowly. Just a point. 
the thing that actually made me feel the difference was not the mistake she made. She didn't care. It was that look like, well, oh, well, I'll, and, and, you know, for someone that is normally very meticulous to suddenly see them not make the effort to respond to something different and move along, that's what really struck me. Michael Malton, Fort Chicago. Um, this isn't probably an option for, for a lot of situations, but in Chicago, um, we've had a couple, I, I can think of a couple of times when someone keeps showing up without dancing. I'm not sure people consider that. I mean, certainly in some cases, like the Alzheimer's, it's productive if they can be dancing, but, I, but in this case, it, it was a younger dancer with uh, multiple sclerosis, and she you know, keeps coming to some of the dances with her husband who dan can, keeps dancing, I'm not sure people think of it. She, ha I mean, she's seeing all the same, the same people that she's seen for years, you know, and, you know, are people considering coming as a social event and hanging out and seeing people? Um, in her case, you know, I think that's great for her. And, and in another case, in, in, another, in a different club, and these are clubs I, I don't call to, these are clubs I dance with, um, where someone kept, was coming because just on a temporary basis, you know, she'd broken her leg. But again, she wanted she, it was a class, and she wanted to keep up with it. You know, are people even considering this as an option? And, and you know, as callers, do we need to put that out as, as something that's available to the dancers? Michelle Jacobs from Hamilton, New Jersey. I guess my question for all of you, and I guess being a special educator, my brain's going here, but the calls that you guys were noticing because your example made me think of it when you said quarter right but between that and the other one was hand contact the other one was more spatial so I guess for me maybe we need to start and we don't know what areas of the brain necessarily is it affecting so maybe we need to start making conscious notice too of what so even if you needed to call, like you had to be more, more tactily based or something as opposed to those that are a little bit more abstract. So maybe we need to start tuning in maybe more to what calls is it. Like you said, some of it was the ones for a long time, but are they the more spatially oriented or whatever or the ones where there's more hand contact? So she's getting support, but she's, it, the spatial awareness is, is maybe what's maybe going away or something. Yeah, like I think you've got a you're onto something there because uh, the the two things I've noticed are the calls that are buried really deep and she's been doing forever, but also the calls where uh, there are hand contacts. Not necessarily. I don't think it's just the factor of uh, of it feels familiar because of the hand contact. It also means that the other dancers can help her more easily. Um, so I stay away from phantoms and situations where she's operating by herself or where other dancers can't. Um, can't help her. I had a, saw a hand down here. I was just going to say, you know, especially the higher level dancers, if something happens where somebody does have to leave, they don't only lose the dance, they lose the, their whole social outlet because a lot of the higher level dancers, that's their only social um, hobby. So it's sort of a double whammy for them when, that's, when that thing happens, you know. Mike Gilden, uh, Aiken, South Carolina. Um, we've had some instances where uh, one or the other spouses has uh, started declining pretty rapidly. Uh, the club seems to be pretty uh, concerned about that, and uh, we've found that we could bring in another person uh, uh, you know, to dance with the uh, healthier one, and then uh, the other one sits and socializes, and they seem to be pretty happy with uh, that situation. Uh, I think uh, with your uh, operation where you have only maybe one square, it's tough, but if you could bring in somebody that would dance with him and let her sit and uh, visit, it might be a worthwhile situation. A thought that, that I've had for some years, and it's almost like the sacrilege thing, you know, you don't want to say it out loud because we all in this room know square dancing is for everyone, right? How long have we heard that? As long as we've been calling, it's, it's for everybody. 
Well, it is and it isn't. And I'm wondering in terms of a long-term approach, if we don't start looking at ways to create, uh, for want of a better word, and I apologize if it's the wrong word, uh, seniors clubs where some of the tempo is adjusted, uh, where complexity might be adjusted. I mean, we know dancers that are just, have just slowed down. It's not that they, they don't understand, and it's not that they don't enjoy it. Uh, but for so long, it's like, oh, that makes them a second-class citizen. And I don't think it should. I don't think it necessarily does. But in terms of a long-term thing, if we could start building that concept as being worthwhile, and not only in daytime. I mean, I know that some of the folks have driving issues at night. But, you know, just if we create some groups over time that are designed to help people that have lost a step or two, you know, uh, or are not quite as clear on things. You know, maybe we need to start some specialty issues like that, but making it a place, a haven, you know, for them to keep doing what they that they love to do. And I don't know how we go about that. I'm throwing this out as just, you know, food for thought. Roy Goddard from New Jersey. A uh, couple of specifics for, you know, as opposed to, we have a, a small advanced club, two squares, on a good night and we have two situations one which worked out very well the other we're going to have to deal with eventually uh, I'll deal with the other first the Alzheimer's uh, the uh, wife informed us right up front early that you know her husband uh, is in the early stages of Alzheimer's he knows it okay and there's no way that we're going to probably at any point say that he can't come because we also know that it is one of the few times he will actually leave the house because he's so paranoid about um, the disease. And Betsy is very careful not to correct him from the microphone because one of the biggest fears of people with Alzheimer's in early stages when they know about it is their fear of embarrassing themselves in public, which is why they're paranoid about going out in public. And I, I've heard other instances where square dancing is one of the few places that they continue to go um, because they're able to do it. And it also does, uh, medical um, research has suggested that it does slow uh, the onset, uh, a combination of physical and mental activity. So just keep that in mind when you're thinking what to do. The other situation which worked out well is we had and most of the people in this club have been with us 15, 20 years, where one member of the committee, um, she had back trouble, and, or the committee, the uh, club, and could no longer dance. And the one man with knees and heart and everything else could dance only once in a while. We kind of, but they knew everybody. We made the suggestion, why don't you guys come out and the respective spouses dance with each other the others can socialize, and then either one wants to dance at any point, we'll find a way for that to happen. And they go, yeah, we didn't think of that. And it worked. Just don't be afraid to suggest such things. Gary Felton from Maryland. You've been addressing the uh, diminished mental capabilities. I have dancers that have told me I don't like singing calls because they hurt. I've gotten that a lot, and I guess it was I'll give credit to Hal Barnes, but I've started writing singing call figures that no longer have swings in them, uh, and I actually tweak up the difficulty level a little bit, and let them dance a little slower to that. I also make it a point to pre-cue the calls so that the first beat is theirs, and they have all the beats in the world to get the job done. So I haven't heard much addressed about physical problems. I think that's an excellent idea. Did you also cut the length of the figure to give them a little extra time to do it? Yeah. Michelle Jacobs again. I actually like John's idea. I mean, more thinking from us with our handy capable, but I think when you have a specialty group or like you guys took an extra night, but your expectations going in are a lot different than if you're still dealing with your, your club that you say C3A is the level and, and this is the way it's going to be. But if it's a club that you say this is, it's just a different set of criteria, but 
this is their place where they're allowed to be. They're allowed to be who they are and things like that. And I think that something along those lines might be something, like I said, how we develop it or whatever. But like with us, with our handicapable groups, they are who they are, and you know that going in. So if you have a group and you say, like John said, whatever the term would, would be, but you know you know that maybe the timing will be, able, but when you know that going in, then if other people want to come, that, but they know that going in. So even if your friends wanted to come, they could still be with their friends or whatever, but the expectations are different. And just a comment on that, the, like the, the issue that I, I see with that is that uh, I think a large part of the reason that they want to come out is because they're with their friends, the friends they have now. So it's difficult to talk to them about going somewhere else. Now, if you could convince the friends to go with them, uh, that might be a, uh, an answer. Uh, it's not clear to me how often you'd be able to make that happen. But um, but a large, to me, a large part of, of what they're seeking by coming out is the uh, comfort of the friendships that they've built up over all this time. Just a comment about the uh, music that, uh, that Mike made. Um, I heard about a study uh, not too long ago uh, where they had uh, come to the conclusion that there are actually special structures in the brain that deal with music and, um, and that it's one of the most you know, rudimentary systems in the human brain. Um, and that's why often people who are you know, approaching being catatonic will still respond to music. And uh, so people that are in a condition that is, um, that is uh, affecting their mental capabilities will often do far better with activities that are uh, have to do with music than they would with others, which is another reason why square dancing in particular is something that you don't want to deny to them. I saw a hand here. Mike Gilden again. You know, we're all talking about the dancers, but uh, some of us uh, are losing our capacity as callers, too. And the question that uh, is on my mind now, when is it going to be that I have to give things up because uh, I am incapable of remembering who's I who is whose corner, etc. And uh, that's going to be a hard thing too because uh, I've spent 35 years uh, in this activity, probably 32 of them calling, and uh, to give it up is going to be a hard thing and, and, and uh, it's going to be something that we're all going to have to face. And uh, we ought to talk about it now, too, huh? Mike Jacobs. First off, Mike, don't forget you got a piece of paper and a pencil. <laughs> I mean, write them down. <laughs> it is, it, it, it's somewhere along the line we set up this, this, this viewpoint that the caller had this omnis omnipotent memory and and I've written corners for 30 years and I'm not about to give that up. And so it, it is whatever I can make easiest for me. And I think there's, I don't think that, that you should feel forced to give up the trade since we so desperately need everybody now. You know, it, it is, you know, we, we talk about wanting to bring a whole bunch of new dancers into the world. If we haven't got callers to call to them, we're stuck with, you know, if we don't have a place for them to go to. And, and so we need who we've got right now. The, the other thing that I have a seniors group right now, I, uh, I inherited them for another caller, and I'm not quite sure of all the calls they know, but my oldest lady is 97, and she swings it on the singing calls and does the line dances. Now, I'll admit, she doesn't get off the ground that much, but at, at the same time, one of the things that, 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 that goes through my mind constantly, it just like Gary pointed out with adjusting his singing call figure, is do I offer the stability of a hand twirl, like a star through a California twirl, or do I remember we've got problems getting the arms up and getting around each other and so forth, so do I do the slide through and partner trade, which may not be successful because they won't have any hands to work with. And so there, there's all kinds of strategies to try to deal with here. I was going to comment a moment ago on what, how you guys at Eric Hanner log in. Sorry. Um, as I go through the years in calling, my perspective, of course, changes. And as it moves, as I get older, it becomes more and more about the people itself and less so much about the specifics of the, of other aspects of it, but more and more about people. It occurs to me 
that you have, a, and, I, and I would have made a vast generalization saying that perhaps a, a, a mainstream or a plus group would be more forgiving of a dancer who had less abilities, and as you went higher up the levels, would be less less forgiving. But it appears to me in your C3A group that you've found a solution for this particular issue. And so that tells me that you've cultivated over the years of this group the kind of loving and caring environment with the people that they are willing to do this and set this up. So you created not just you know, great choreography, you created an environment with the people where there's allowance for other people with diminished capabilities and they've, they've created a solution that worked for you. And so my comment on that is that um, I have to think of the same thing with the groups because it's not just that one couple I mentioned Our, earlier. I look at the average age on a lot of my groups and it's really creeping very high. I'm watching their abilities start to slow down and realize more and more that the, it's m largely my responsibility to work with the club to keep creating the environment where everybody's happy about having being there with the people and less so much about whether or not we got through everything perfectly and one person made a mistake or didn't make a mistake. So my comment on that is about creating an environment where it works for everybody. Janet Oliveri from North Bend, Colorado. I'm not a caller. I'm a dancer. I was a dancer. I no longer dance because of my knees. When I was dancing and towards the end of that time, I knew which callers I could dance to. They knew, I knew which ones called smooth, which is really important, which ones had shorter tips, which is really important, and which ones maybe didn't dance call quite so fast, uh, which is also really important. I also found a, another lady who loves to dance, also had some problems like I did. I love to do the patter now. Hated patter when I first started dancing. I only love singing calls. Patter I love because I only dance with Mike. When it came to twirling, swinging, doing those things, he knew how to take care of me. So I would dance the patter. She would dance the singing call, part of the tip. Those are things that worked for us, and it works in a lot of the clubs that we do because, again, our dancers are getting up there a little bit. John Marshall again. I wanted to address Mike's observation because I thought that was not only excellent, but I also thought it was rather brave of you to go down that road uh, in a room full of callers. But there are, you need to make you or any caller who starts to approach that area where they're not sure that there's, they've still got the handle that, that they used to have necessarily, um, there are tools, there are instruments, there are things available to you that you may be able to change your approach. When I, I've been calling 37 years, and when I started, you didn't read anything. I mean, when you were flat told in caller school, you don't do that. Real callers don't do that. You don't put notes in front of you. You put nothing between you and the dancers. And I mean, that was preached by top name callers, and they believed that. And th that has gone by the wayside to a great deal. And there are tools and instruments that you know you can use, even if it's all pre-written. But you you know, Ian, you don't have to remember it if you put it on a computer screen in big font or. You know, different things like that, you know, that you know that you've got access to what you need. Yeah, you have to learn some new skills, but you don't, like, if you decide to go the computer route, you don't need to know everything about computers. You just need to know that much, that little bit to get you where you need to be. And I think all the callers need to be kind of looking ahead to, it's still part of improving yourself. It's still part of continuing education, you know, and you're responding, you know, any of us could be responding to different ways of handling things. Um, to be able to stay in it. Not only are we important to the activity, but we don't have our own love of the activity and the people too, or we wouldn't still be doing it. So there are tools that you should take advantage of. You know what we uh, discussed earlier that about my abilities with the computer, so I guess that sort of leaves me out, doesn't it? <laughs> and, and it might not be, this is Jean Lee from Cocoa, Florida. And this is my first time here, and I'm just beginning on, on the very beginning edge of this whole new life. 
And my comment might not be very popular, but you might take a look at the way round dancing is done, where the early rounds are generally at a higher level, and then the rounds that are done during the square dance are phase two, maybe phase two plus one, phase three. So you might be able to structure your program where you do a higher level in the beginning of the evening, and then the people with diminished capacities come in and you do a little lower level of whatever you're doing. There's certainly, I can certainly see some situations, I mean, I don't think it worked for our personal situation, but I can certainly see lots of situations where that might well work. And I mean, this is, we want this to be a general thing for all kinds of people. Uh, suggestion, oh, sorry, Roy Gatta, New Jersey, with what John was talking about and the tools that are available. Um, it's been rumored that um, callers tend to have egos. <coughs> so to approach someone with the suggestion that, well, maybe you're, you know, slipping or you need a little this or that, there's, there's ways to do that. And then I'll use the family. Um, Betsy's father was calling had gotten really terrible. Uh, he was, and um, mostly just stagnated. So one year for a Christmas present, she gave him a caller's note service. Okay. And, and there's ways to approach things like say someone obviously can't find their corners. Well, there's little tools and pads that, you know, all kind of things that sell. Most callers just take a piece of scrap paper and write it down, but they have little corner writing down thingies, okay? Say, and you buy one and say, look at this neat thing I just bought for myself. This is really cool. I can write my corners down. And I don't have to worry about scrap paper. Kind of like maybe they'll get the idea type of thing. So there's ways to approach it without going up and saying, by the way, you're getting really lousy type, you know, in so many words. Jean Lee from Cocoa, Florida. Jerry Reed has a form. You might contact him that, that he uses for corners. Mike Jacobs. Um, yeah, I've forgotten. Oh, well. <laughs> I guess if we'd had the music on, I'd remember. <laughs> I didn't have a pad. <laughs> It's gone. <laughs> Cinda asked from Rockton, Illinois. Um, this is in reference to the physical diminished capacities. And um, we found, too, that if we um, tell people that it's okay to take a little shortcut here and there um, and make them feel like it's all right to do that and allow them to continue to dance, that um, I, sometimes it takes myself or my husband to tell them that it's okay um, and not to that you know because they're not doing it legally you know and they feel a little bit more comfortable I also know that my husband um, we were in a at a Chicago club that's a singles club that's um, at a very high age level and I danced the first tip and I came off of the tip and I said to him okay you have to cut out all promenades because they're never going to make it around <laughs> and he did and it worked really well. So when we call for that club, or it's my job, of course, to, as his partner, to alert him, okay, that they're not making it, you need to, you know, cut that down. So um, now I'm trying to work on him to eliminate a lot of the swings and do-si-dos for the people in the age, that age groups. So it's something to think about. Do you remember? Actually, during the Denver National, we, we observed a, a lady that was out on the floor of the, the line dance hall with a cane. And and she didn't use a cane in an obstructive manner. It was basically, it, it helped solidify the weak leg. And, you know, and we need to offer those strategies to our people because, just like John mentioned, they didn't think of that as a solution. And, and we need to start offering them different solutions while they're out there. And so it, it, it's being open to creative ideas, just like the idea of changing the approach on, on the dance. I've called for a number of groups in the Midwest that have put the star tips, the higher lower tips, at the beginning of the dance. Now, we always get this process in our mind that it's got to be this build up to the top or whatever, but it doesn't have to be that way. And the advantage we get is that we all end the dance together, not this, this slow fade out with tip after tip that starts pushing people out the door. 
you triggered something with me, Cinda, that we're seeing rampant issues of dancers not promenading. They're refusing to promenade. They're just stopping. It's okay. We know how to promenade. And, no, and of course, wait a minute. Promenade's a call. So is circle left. These are calls. But I started looking at my own calling, and I had some help from a European caller who brought this to my attention. He said, you're lazy. He said, you callers, you, you, you've all gotten lazy. I said, what do you mean? Well, one of the things you all do is that uh, you have us do a full right and left grand and a full promenade. And the dancers in Europe won't do that because they're not supposed to do that. They, they learn where does a promenade begin and where does a promenade end. And the callers, most all the callers in Europe, if you pay attention to them, when they finish right and left grand, the promenade is halfway, certainly no more than three quarters of the way around to get home. Um, when and they never end a tip, by the way, at the end of the tip across the square. You know, the tip's over, you know, you've resolved, so there's your partner, bow to your partner, and you're halfway across the square from the original starting point. They find that offensive. That doesn't bother me as much as the other, though, but if we, I think part of the reason that dancers are starting to refuse the promenade is because we as callers are making them walk way too far. You know, it's not, you know, we're, we're not paying attention. I'm not, I'm not speaking to everybody else in the room, but I'm saying I was guilty of that and I've seen other callers and I'm trying to be much more conscious about where does the sequence end in the square? We need to be good enough to do that, that we're not dancing the dancers into the ground just by walking them in a circle constantly. And so I'm trying to be better about that. And I think that I think we've created a monster here in, in the states, you know, with that kind of situation, so we have to get on top of our game a little bit better. That'll at least help a little bit. My feeling from here is that everybody thinks there's some problems. Mike Jacobs, um, there's an interesting a, a group that solved the promenade problem in Chicago, and that was that they never. If if they hit at, you promenade to the like setup. So you start as a head couple. You only promenade as far as the next head position. So that that all promenades are actually less than half. Now it screws with the timing and the singing calls. <laughs> Realize that that's going to be your strategy factor. But at the same time, if you make it okay, then all the promenade everybody will promenade at least X amount. And X amount isn't terribly far. And so it, it, that way you don't get dancers disagreeing on what constitutes a promenade. You get the officers in the backing up, paper crashing into each other. At, at least you get some benefit of the promenade call without them going all the way around the setup. This probably doesn't respond to the disabilities, but it responds to John's promenades. I have the same thing in my group. And I've turned it into a game with them. And when I get enough of the drag backs and the I refuse to promenade, I have things that end up with star through. Couples circulate and I'll turn it into a promenade to where it's five quarters of the way around. And I turn it into a game with them. There's one thing that hasn't come up, Gardner Patton from New Jersey. Uh, the question is, you know, people who may be declining may also be dancing at the level of people who are coming up. And we have some people in our club who have retired almost to be angels because they find out the speed that the class is going is a speed that they can dance. And then they feel that they're giving something to these new people coming up and they can still do it. And if you as a caller can make that kind of a dance fun for those people and fun for the students coming along, you may have a solution that, uh, you know, we have about half the club, I think, dances as angels with the class. That's a fantastic suggestion. Okay. I hate to cut this short, but our, our time is uh, almost over. Uh, clearly, we have um, a lot to talk about. I'm I was torn at the beginning of this meeting as to whether I wanted to have a big crowd show up, which indicated we have a big problem, or whether we, nobody would show up, which indicated that, well, maybe we have a problem in our area, but at least it wasn't uh, general. Clearly, there are uh, issues here that uh, people are trying to cope with. Um, I've heard a number of you know, good comments and suggestions come out. Um, I heard some themes. Uh, one is I think there seemed to be a general agreement that 
we have a responsibility to uh, not just callers to dancers, but dancers to other dancers. And we recognize that this is a, a social activity and that we're not just talking about some kind of a, of a financial transaction here, um, that we are a community and as such we owe, we have certain responsibilities to, to our members. And people seem to feel that way generally. That was the sense that I got. Uh, because all the conversation that I heard was around how do we assist these people, how do, you know, how do we make it uh, work for them. Um, I think we have a definite uh, distinction between uh, physical disabilities and, and mental disabilities. They need to be handled in different ways. Uh, clearly, your situation where you can deal with a, with a physical problem by uh, making a singing call figure shorter and cutting out things that cause them pain when they, <laughs> when they do them, it, it, I think that's a little easier to manage than cases where you've got people who don't have the cognitive abilities anymore to, to be able to do what they were doing. Uh, but I also heard uh, comments about ways that you could cope with, with that sort of thing and ways that you could support the people as long as they were um, capable of, of handling it at all. Um, I, I wrote some notes here, which I can barely read now, so, so whether I'll be able to distill them into some sort of a report, I don't know. But uh, what's the feeling amongst the group here for where we should go with this? Should we just say, fine, we had a nice conversation and go home? Uh, should we try and create maybe an email list? We have everybody's uh, email address. Uh, should we talk to the Caller Lab Board of Governors about setting up a committee? What do you think? I really think that if we can put together these ideas in a document for other callers to use, it would be another Caller Lab product. That I think that would be a very useful thing for them to see. And we may use the email list to do that where your notes become the starting point and then we all chime in with the things that we want to make a little bit larger in concept. So put it on your critique sheets. I will, as was suggested, uh, try and write up a little report. I'll circulate it to you via email. And we can use that as the beginning of, a, of an email conversation to start with, and we can probably uh, decide how far we take it from there. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I appreciate your participation. It's one of the best groups I've seen so far for participation.